a pleasant day STEM learners. This is Sir Peter, your statistics and probability teacher. For today's discussion, we will talk about the central limit theorem. So at the end of this video lesson, you should be able to explain the concept of the theorem itself. And we will also review or define the sampling distribution of the sample means using that theorem. So let's proceed. Remember week number five, when we draw samples from the population, what might happen? So these are the possible results. So the values of the variable could take different probability distributions. It could be normal, just like what we have discussed in your weeks three to four. Okay, so there is a large frequency on the center and extremely decreasing frequency on the tails of the distribution. So that is how the bell-shaped curve looks like. But when you perform sampling techniques, you can also have right skewed distribution, a left skewed distribution, or, or a uniform distribution. So let's talk about those types of distribution. So for a right skewed distribution, notice that there is long tail in the positive direction of the number line. And so the mean is also to the right of the peak. And that peak is described by the mode. So observe the graph here. That's why the right skewed distribution is also called the positive skewed distribution. Let's have a practical example. So the income is prominent example of positively skewed distribution. This is because a large percentage of the total people residing in a particular area or community tends to fall under the category of the low income earning group. So in the Philippines, we have a right skewed distribution because many have low or middle income. And only few people fall under the high income earning group. Another example. The exam of the scores in any particular difficult exam will be positively skewed because students may get lower scores and only fewer will get higher scores. That is only when the exam is difficult. Now, let us talk about the left skewed distribution. So that is the opposite. Notice that the long tail in the direction, negative direction of the number line is long. Okay, And the mean is also on the left of the peak. And that is the mode. Look at the mean compared to the mode. So this left skewed distribution is also sometimes called the negatively skewed distribution. So examples of depth skewed distribution are, most people tend to die after reaching an average age while only few die too soon or too late. So if you are younger, then you are part of the left tail. But as you age, then the higher the chance um, that you um, um, die. So if such data is plotted along the linear line, most of the values would be present on the right side. So there is higher probability of dying as you get older. So hence, this representation is clearly left or negatively skewed in nature. And that talks about the human life cycle. Another example is the retirement age. Okay. So most people tend to choose retirement around the age of 50, while a few opt to retire in their 40s. So if such data is required to be represented graphically, the most suited distribution would be the left or the negatively skewed distribution. Of course, you will not retire on an early age. Instead, 50 or above, you can already retire and enjoy your pension. 
for a uniform distribution. It is called a rectangular distribution in which it has a constant probabilities. So every value of the random variable has equal corresponding probabilities on it. Let's have examples. Probability of landing on each side of a die. So the probability of one is one over six, the probability of getting two is one over six, and so on. Up to the probability of getting six is also one over six. So when you form the histogram, the histogram will look like this, and that is what you call a uniform distribution. The same thing when you flip a coin or you toss a coin, okay, the probability of Getting a head is one half, and the probability of getting a tail is one half. So in this particular examples, there is an even chance to either get a head or a tail. So that when you draw the histogram, we can also form a uniform distribution. But with all the three types of distributions that I have discussed, as a researcher, your goal is to reach a normal distribution. So how do you guarantee that? Look at this practical example on your modified assessment. In figure 1a, there are 15 samples, I mean 15 uh, population size represented by capital N is equal to 15. And for the sample, we have small n is equal to 1. So when you take only one, there will be a uniform distribution. So that is figure 1b. On the second figure, look at figure 2a. Our population size is still 15, while our sample size becomes 2. So you get two values. And this will how the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means will look like. And as we go further, look at that one. We select now a sample size of three, and that is how it would look like. What do you think will happen if we will increase sample size? Of course, the answer will be it reach the central limit theorem. What is a central limit theorem? So the central limit theorem states that the given uh, that given a large sample size, the sampling distribution of the mean for the variable will approximate a normal distribution because as a researcher, that is your target to make your respondents or participants of the study to be normal. So how could we achieve that? Based from the central limit theorem, we have to make our sample size large enough to guarantee that theorem. So, these are the different types of distribution, and all of this must be like this, a normal distribution. So how do you know if your sample is large? So we have a standard that we use in research. So when your n is greater than or equal to 30, then that is a large population already. So we use a distribution called a C distribution. However, if your sample is small, therefore, we cannot represent it anymore by the population standard deviation, sigma, but we use another um, representation for the um, distance away from the mean, which is small letter s. So if sigma is unknown, we can use small letter s as a representation for the standard deviation. However, since your n will be small sample, that will be n is less than 30 samples. Suppose that your study has limited number of respondents, then you can perform another type of um, distribution, which is the t distribution. So you are not allowed to use the z distribution. Instead, we use a uh, t distribution. And all of that, will be discussed in your week number seven. So do not forget that the central limit theorem has the following properties. So the first property is 
the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means is always equal to the population mean. That is mu sub x bar, this is sub x bar, typographical error, is equal to mu. So you go back with our week five video lessons and you will determine uh, when we get the population mean and the mean of the sampling distribution, you notice that in the given example, they are equal. Okay, so they are actually always equal. Second property. So these are the formulas that you're going to use for your computations on the applications of central limit theorem. So in problem solving, these are the formulas. The standard deviation is equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. So that is sigma sub x bar. This should be sub x bar. Is equal to sigma over the square root of n. That is when your population is infinite, meaning you do not know your exact sample size. However, if the sample, um, the population size I mean is given, so you use the formula sigma sub x bar is equal to sigma over the square root of n times the population correction factor. Okay, because your capital N or the population size is given, so you have to subtract it from the sample size over the population size minus one. Then getting its square root will determine the population correction factor. So that is another way of determining the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means when your population is finite. So on the next part of the discussion, we are still on week number six. We will talk about the application of this theorem. So again, this is Sir Peter, your statistics and probability teacher.